So we're here at the SS Atlantic Heritage Museum in Terrence Bay, Nova Scotia. And it's the off season, which uh, means the museum is actually closed during the winter until May. And uh, we're taking advantage of that time to document the artifacts that they have in their collection. Now, as you know, we work a lot with Bill Sauter, who uh, did the documenting for the Titanic artifacts. And he worked with the photographs and he, he wrote up all these fantastic descriptions per item. And we're following this format and applying the same structure to the archives of the SS Atlantic artifacts, give them the same treatment and try to document them in the same kind of way. So over here we're working on photographing them. If you want to come over this way, Emma, what are, what are we photographing right now? We are photographing a rubber overshoe. A rubber overshoe is what we're photographing right now. We actually have a few examples of these in our personal collection from the 1930s. A woman would have worn it over her, over her boots or over her shoes, and this would have protected that from the rain or, or the mud. And this was found on the wreck, made in New Jersey. Was that New Brunswick, New Jersey? So New Brunswick in the bottom, yeah. New Brunswick, New Jersey on the bottom. This is Dee. She is the president of the Titanic Society of Atlantic Canada. And what are you doing? I am typing in to the information that's provided to me to in order to catalog each of the artifacts. And we type them in as lots and describe the um, items, the part of the ship they're from, and the type of materials that they're made of, etc. We also have Bob Chalk here. Hi, Bob. Hi. <laughs> Bob is the author of SS Atlantic, the White Star Line's first disaster at sea. Well, my job is basically to provide some background on many of the artifacts. Uh, sometimes I have some color commentary that I can make about the dive in which it happened, the individual who found it, when it uh, was found, how they found it, and that sort of thing. Bob, what can you tell me about, about that? It was probably uh, part of the ship and not part of the cargo. There were other similar types of pieces were found um, you know, on the, at the wreck site and recovered. Made of bronze, uh, very nicely patined. The interesting thing about it is that it, uh, the writing on the bottom has got a really neat connection to the person who owned it at one time. And the interesting thing about it is there's also a connection to the uh, Halifax explosion because it was at the same, virtually uh, days after the Halifax explosion that this piece was given to a guy named Jack Gray by his grandmother. I'm unsure if the piece is actually, is actual gold, because I'm not seeing any marks on it, more than likely it is, but the enamel that is on the front, on the top and on the front is starting to, of course, give way. What's interesting, really interesting about this is that that little piece is raised. It almost looks like something would have clipped onto that, possibly a chain, because otherwise that, that ball or bead should be attached to the gold. It appears that if there, was, if there was indeed a chain attached, it would have hooked from there and it hooked onto this. So again, that's another safety feature. Yeah, this would have been a lot belonged to a saloon class passenger. I wish there was some sort of mark to identify who it belonged to. How many saloon class women were there? There were only like a handful. Probably a dozen. Yeah, about a dozen. <clears throat> now, Bob. Are there any items in the collection here where we can identify who it belonged to on the ship? Mm, there might be one. Um, sec now, let's, okay. Yeah, this is it. This is all that remains of a straight razor. All of the metal has completely decomposed, but it is a straight razor and the name on it is W. Garvey. And there's a number there. And W. Garvey was William Garvey who was in the steerage. Uh, we believe he was Irish. What's yeah. the item you got here? It's a key tag, and it says, Saloon Entrance, Wheelhouse, Starboard. Which, Starboard, of course, being the right-hand side, here is the wheelhouse, right? the, the, the small building on the top there, and below that is the saloon. So this indicates that this belonged to a door that was on the right-hand side of that building, across from the door that you see there now. And that was how you gained entrance to the saloon area from that deck. This bolt right here is what would have fastened the propeller blades 
to the actual body of the ship. Look at this, this thing weighs a ton. It still contains a piece of the hub that it was screwed onto. Take a look at this. It still has the bolt that the nut would have fastened onto. This was sheared clean off. Just the fact that that nut is kicking around, and I know of another one that's come up, the fact that they're there, not part of the propeller, is another indicator that the, the blades might have been sheared off. Emma, what's been your favorite artifact so far? Oh, my favorite artifact? There's been so many. <laughs> the jewelry is really interesting. How they found all these tiny little pieces and assembled them together. My favorite artifacts have been the jewelry as well, and the crosses. My favorite artifact, uh, it has to do probably with the clock. It has a great story behind it and uh, the fact that it still runs and we still have the key to it, I find very exciting. It was the clock that uh, the captain used for his navigation and it's the clock that the quartermaster, Robert Thomas, would have looked at uh, when he was steering the ship during the last moments before they struck and which Thomas used to make his point to the fourth officer that uh, they were getting much too close to the coast of Nova Scotia and uh, as we, we know, the two officers ignored his warnings and eventually the disaster took place. So I find that very exciting that, uh, that we have that clock here. So here is another fun item that we've been able to identify. There is a medallion type token that was pulled off of the wreck. It's very, very hard to read. In fact, we can tell it has words on it, but we can't identify what the words actually say until we realize that it actually as a modern day counterpart, actually in my pocket. And that is what's called a miraculous medal. Um, it is a, it's a Catholic item, and um, there were some Catholics on board, and we were able to see that they haven't changed all that much since then. The material has changed, but the actual designs on them have not. That's incredible. I didn't know they went back that far. This is a nice little piece. It's a picture of the ship. This, this card is called, it was called a trade card. They were given out to people uh, to promote the White Star Line and specific ships. Front shows the vessel itself under full sail, which uh, it was under full sail from time to time, but the ship was primarily a steamer, so that was her main means of propulsion. And on the back, there's uh, a sketch of the saloon class quarters, what today would be called first class quarters. In those days they were called saloon class or cabin class as well. And it just shows the layout and the number of uh, washroom facilities and so on. Even though it was first class, each cabin did not have uh, washroom facilities or toilet facilities. Uh, they had to go to a common area, which was for the cabin class folk, but still they had to share. All right, so here we have a woman's shoe. There's not too much we can tell about it. There's no design on it, and uh, we can barely even really measure it because it's, it shrank as it was drying out, and um, it's very much rotten. I think we have a complete shoe. There's a few other fragments over there, and I think together we have a complete shoe. But here is something that I just find to be very interesting. On the bottom, we have a scrape, actually a couple of scrapes, and it digs in, and the leather is still peeled back. So this tells me that if someone was wearing this on the ship, which they might not have been, could have been thrown in luggage or something like that, but if someone wore it on the ship, that scratch happened during the voyage. And someone, this is a left shoe, by the way, it's a, it's a woman's left shoe. She would have taken a step forward like that, and, and done a slight rotation as she landed. The, the footstep would have skidded a very, very tiny bit, and dug in, and you can tell that the damage is recent because the piece that was peeled off is still there. If the woman was walking around for another couple of weeks even, that piece would have fallen off. But something sharp happened, and we know that that sharp damage was not after the wreck. We know that it was not underwater. It didn't happen down there because this, this took weight. This took the weight of a person stepping on it. So it's just very interesting to be able to extrapolate a very, very brief instance 
in the owner's life, the very end of their life, actually. We know that she didn't survive because no women survived the Atlantic. So it's just amazing that we're able to pull out a piece, a tiny detail like that. And it just kind of adds life to the story. And that's what we're cataloging here with all these different artifacts here at the, uh, from the SS Atlantic in 1873. Speaking of shoes, there's another shoe that goes with this one. It wasn't a lot together. I've divided them up because they're not a pair. It turns out they're both left shoes and they don't match. This one is the other one right here and you can see it has sort of like a loop-de-loop -loop stitch pattern going across right there on the toe. And that's not there on the other one. So this one is a boot and the other one is an actual just plain shoe. We don't know who they belong to. We don't know if it's the same woman. They are approximately the same size. We thought they were a matching pair at one point, but upon closer inspection, we see that they're not a matching pair and they're both left. There's no way to actually identify who they belong to or if it was the same person or even where they came from on the ship. Cargo hold, luggage, or a person's cabin or a body. We have no idea. The wreckage was just obliterated. First, the sea came in and pounded the ship to pieces, and then salvagers and people were looking for the bodies to go and bury them were literally blowing the ship apart with explosives. So there's very, you can get a lot of, you can get a lot of information out of the ship through archeology, span but you're not gonna get a full picture because there's so much tampering with the wreck, thanks to the explosives and thanks to the pounding surf of 145 years. So um, there's still a lot of gaps. We're not gonna be able to fill in the full story, but it's something. It's definitely something to be able to give the tiniest bit of life to their stories in the last few days of the voyage. We're on the last artifact now over here. It is a leather shoe fragment. This is item number 209C, piece of this shoe. And that's it. That's it? We're done? We're done. All right. That's it, everybody. Yay. We're finished. Yay. That's been two long days of cataloging information. Not only do we now have a formal master list of every item in the museum's collections, but we were able to identify a number of new things as well that were unknown or, or misidentified, and now it just kind of helps piece together more of the story. It's been a wonderful experience to work the last couple of days on cataloging the items and really getting the experience of what passengers and crew may have gone through. Yeah, for sure. The, uh, what I especially appreciated was the, the depth of knowledge of uh, Tom and Dee and Emma and uh, how much they added to this whole process, which uh, I learned so much about our collection that I thought I knew everything there was to know about it, but I, I realized from this experience that I had a lot more to learn. So it was a great time, very, very fruitful. Now after two days of photographing and measuring and, and taking very brief on-site notes, now we actually have to go into the second phase of it. We've actually done two collections over the last two days. One was the museum's official collection as well as the uh, one of the private collections that is often on loan to the museum. We might be doing one more, which is Bob's personal collection, but after this, we now have to take the photographs and the, the notes and the measurements and cross-check everything and then do additional research, identify the few that we have no idea what it is yet, follow a few leads on what some things might be, and uh, make an official formatted document with the help of Bill Sauter, who's going to be helping with that and make sure that is available to the museum and I guess anyone else who might want to access it. Thank you and good night. <laughs>